What's going on, everyone? Episode two of Conversation with Coaches. This week, I'm going to have Jordan Wong on. Jordan Wong is a competitive powerlifter who's broken two all-time world records in the 220 Open Class for Sleeve Squat. He has started his own gym. He runs and directs meets. He's refed for years. Uh, he's probably, probably responsible for the most growth recently in Florida powerlifting uh, as of late between, you know, the WRPF growing down in Miami with Alex Uslar and the kind of the fall off of the USPA of recent. So it's an opportunity for a lot of people to jump into a new realm with powerlifting in, in Florida. And he's got a meet coming up that's going to have, I think, about 5,000 cash and prizes, which is pretty good for a relatively local meet. We're just going to wait for Jordan to click the uh, join button, get a request going here. And uh, I know he's on here. Let's see if it pops through. But we'll get him on here, and I have a list of questions that I want to ask him, and some people sent me some questions, like Jana, who's opening up. There it is. Jana's opening up the new. Which we'll talk about as well, because that's also a significant part of Florida piloting history, and there's a lot to learn and a lot to take from that. So we'll get Jordan through here, and we'll go through these questions. And we're going to I got to read this. What's happening, man? Hello. It's meal time. Epic. Is it epic meal time or just meal time? Just meal time. It's just meal time. I am, uh, I am like four days away from epic meal time after I make weight. Somewhere under three days. I don't know. Whatever today is. Today's Tuesday. Uh, um, I like to skip the intro of who you are and get to know you bullshit because let's be real. Everyone fast forward, clear that on table talk and every other podcast and on the main. It's really important to hear 20, 20 minutes of someone's life history when they were seven and their relationship. So let's get into brass tacks here. You own Showcase Strength and Fitness, a gym in Southwest Florida. Yes. You run North. the RPS meets, or most of them, throughout Southwest Florida? Yes, I think you're the only one. <laughs> I think so. Now, I don't know if Smash, is Smash, does Smash still count? Are they RPS? I don't even know. Um, you have broken the all-time world record squat twice in 220? Mm-hmm. Let's see. That'd be three. Uh, what am I forgetting? Oh, you're a DILF. Gonna Jordan's a DILF. Three times. It's going to be three. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. <laughs> it's going to be three. So there's a lot going on. Let's first start with that. I want to go into the genesis of Showcase Strength and Fitness because we have a lot of people who did ask about that because you grew and started a gym relatively fast by necessity. You were coaching a little bit online, um, a small amount locally, and you were working full-time as a trainer in a gym, and then COVID happens. You know, everything shut down, and as a necessity, people needed both a place to train and guidance, and the House of Wong was born. Yes. So let's go through that real quick. Let's talk about what brought you to creating the Showcase Strength and Fitness Gym. Okay. So kind of like you said, COVID hit. The gym I worked at shut down. I was fortunate enough to be the personal training manager there. And honestly, like at that time, the gym was kind of going downhill in terms of like, management and involvement from the higher ups because we did switch companies and I was I won't say I was running the show but I was kind of the person that was like always there and I was the only trainer besides Linda who you know who does my meets as well mm -hmm. and when it shut down I just told her I was like hey I have a three-car garage full of gym equipment let's bring our people there and then it started off as we're gonna just train our people there make a little money not let our people fall off and then I just started getting text messages. Hey, can I come train? Can I come train? I'm like, oh, time to make some money. So I had <laughs> five, five or ten dollars a day. I did some, I think five dollars a day, twenty dollars for five visits. Made like eight thousand dollars in the month of March and April. Not even um, was able to keep the bills afloat. And I actually kind of grew the personal training business. I had I grew hers. And then May came. We went back to the gym, and you could tell we just didn't like it. So we kind of did both at the same time. And then that parent company that bought it out went out of business in October, and it's early October, 2020. So I was like, fuck, I gotta do something. So I opened the gym like six days later. So just to back tack that, because people who often think about wanting to open up a gym, you built the community first. You didn't just jump to a gym space and say, here we are. You started with a small community that was growing to a point where it was expanding beyond your space within your home, which is super profitable because you're not paying anything to live there except for your, your mortgage. But the gym space started to get expanded beyond that. So you had the community and you needed a location to keep expanding more. So you started with community and then found location. Oh, yeah. If I was like, hey, I'm going to open up a gym, start from scratch, I don't know that I'd even be paying the rent yet at my current place. I mean, like I'd probably just be getting by. Right. Because I was fortunate 
pers- like I said, from the other gym at the time it was called Around the Clock Fitness. I had the personal training clients, just people I knew there, employees, and they had a good boot camp program, and they all followed me. And um, a good, good portion of them are still there, even though we don't have that program. And they just do powerlifting now, or they train like powerlifters, even if they don't want to compete. See, there's another aspect you took with you, is you took the business model from the previous company, and you started with the boot camp. So you had general fitness clients. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't just powerlifting gym. Oh. You were making with general fitness clients, boot camp clients, which then transcended to, hey, we want to try this powerlifting thing you're all about. Yeah, 100%. And from what I can tell, I was nervous about that too. Like, obviously, most of the equipment I was buying was powerlifting related. I'm like, well, what are they going to do? And then it kind of hit me like they like doing this shit. So <laughs> you know what a powerlifting meet was. They like getting underneath the bar, learning the movement. They kind of got over the jumping around for 60 minutes and feeling tired bullshit. And then just it just slowly evolved into what it is now. And kind of backtracking again to being at that other gym. A lot of people, when they say they want to open up a gym, they say all this type of shit. Like, I don't want to work at a commercial gym. It's free on the job training. So, like, you take things that you want to learn or you take things that would benefit you and that wouldn't. You mix them together and you can form a pretty good system like, if you pay attention to that stuff. Yeah, that's like, that was something I did tremendously when I opened my own studio as I came from the corporate world, corporate gym structure, managing with 24 Fitness and, and uh, I was able to bring all my clients out with me, but also that structure that those systems are in place and they're in place for a reason from the corporate structure because it works yeah. and you grow the business from there. So, okay, so that has started from the creation of the gym, which then you had all these people who initially started off as like, general fitness bootcamp clients who were becoming interested in power thing, all of a sudden it's like, hey, I think I have enough people to throw a meet. Is that kind of the way it went? Yeah. Um, I think I had, I think June 2021 was the first meet. Wanted to put one. I remember talking about it in February on the ride home from the hybrid meet with Alexis. And we just named it uh, Showcase Super Classic. She's like, it has to have the name Super in it. <laughs> so, all right, we'll do that. <laughs> and then, then we started playing the meet. And then it was one day, and I sold out in a day. So I was like, well, maybe I'll do two days. And it wasn't just my gym members either, because at the time, I pro- if you look at, like, the group pictures over the meets, it's larger and larger and larger. And I think I might have had 12 people in that first one. And now I have, like, fucking 30, 40. Okay, so all this leads together, which is why I'm asking this, because everybody wants to know this. Community first. Expanded to a point where you needed more space for the gym. Yeah. Expanded to a point where all of them wanted the power lift, so you threw a meet, which everyone could compete at locally, which has grown to 30 to 40 members of your gym. Almost every competition you throw, which is a guaranteed 30 to 40 entries, because you throw about three a year. And all of those people, if I'm not mistaken, are also on in-house, most of them are in-house programming with you. Yes. So it's a really good it compounds. Yep. And I didn't do that. And I wish I said I did, because it makes me sound smart, but it worked out really good. It's a great model. I, I really hope everyone's paying attention to that who asked me about your gym structure and how you made it to thrive because it literally was that step process of community, expand to this point where you need more space, grow the community even more in a space where everybody's getting to a point where they want to do powerlifting, not has to do powerlifting. They had options of general fitness or powerlifting. Uh, and, of course, if you're going to have them try powerlifting and they're going to need a spot to test themselves, so he did a local meet. Uh, like you said, it intended on being a one-day meet, but it sold out more than one day because of the support that the Florida community has for Jordan. And next thing you know, it was a two-day meet. Uh, I get the honor of getting the ref those, which is a lot of fun. Uh, hang out with your mom and hit on her. And uh, then from those meets, now all these people who need powerlifting specific programming who don't necessarily know where they're going, what they're doing, have hired you for powerlifting coaching. Yes. So most of them, some of them started off like in-person, personal training sessions, and I'm very glad they transitioned out of that into programming because one that showed me they knew how to lift, and two, like I just didn't have the time. So like I was training, shit, like eight, ten hours every day, and then most of them transitioned to like my programming. So they update the sheet once a week, kind of like you do. Just yeah. yeah so and I, the cool thing is, is like even though I don't work on with them one on one, even if I'm busy at the gym, I see most of their lifts. So like. Unfortunately, a lot of them don't give a lot of feedback where you want them to give feedback, like in the sheets or email. But since I see it, I kind of have a good idea what's going on. So it makes things a lot easier than 
text or email me what's going on. They don't do it, and you're just fucking guessing. <laughs> So, I have a, I've half my clientele that sometimes I'm blind to each week about what's going on because they don't update me. So yeah, you're very fortunate in that aspect that you get to see them in person and you get to build even stronger connections as their coach to advise, cue, or help them in person. I know there's even been times you're like, hey, what the fuck's going on here? What do I do? <laughs> I'm like, okay, here's what I see. Let's let's work on this, which is yeah. cool. Uh, I love part of that community as well. By extension, even got to a point where I I, I shouldn't say I consider it because I still do sometimes consider moving out that way just to hang out and have fun in your gym. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Showcase Strength and Fitness, Jordan's gym has got, how many members do you have total now? I think I'm just under 200. 200 members for yeah. a thriving powerlifting mainly gym. Now you, you have other trainers in there who don't just do powerlifting, right? They, they sublet or you hire them out for groups. I know you have a youth group right now, a teen youth group. Yeah, so I, I tried the personal training thing. It just never really worked out because I don't have that commercial model where people walk in and, like, fit in the sales orientation. They either come in and want training or they just kind of watch you ask. So I train a lot of the people. My goal is to have personal trainers and actually have them fill their desired book and make it very affordable for them. Uh, right now, Tiffany just came on, and I'm glad she did because she's really good. Like, I'm not just saying this because she's a friend of mine, but, like, she's better than me with, like, your general population. Mm -hmm. Like, if I could just be like, hey, take all these people because you're more patient, like, you're just better. She's better with people. <laughs> hey, uh, so she just started doing her own small group with a group of, like, stay-at-home moms or some shit. And, like, they're all friends. And they, she does that, does her programming for the week. I think she has two one-on-one -on -one people now and she's also an f45 instructor over at the second chance gym down the street so she's getting experience in all areas um uh, megan uh morat more i don't know at more whatever she oh. has a big online business and she trains a couple people but other than that um sonia used to do her group fitness but after the hurricane the gym kind of built out in a way differently that wouldn't really um work for her but she found a good personal training studio <laughs> and eric <laughs> <laughs> i see eric's coming out there she's way out of uh, so okay so he's back I touch too, so sorry to ramble but no you're good that's what i want to touch on is you used your resources within the yeah. facility so I instead of looking for trainers outwards you brought people up within the community like i know i know megan came on to that local gym and kind of wanted to try powerlifting. Yeah. Um, got a pretty big influence on, on Instagram and she also does nutrition coaching. So the one hand feeds the other. She's allowed to pick up, you know, clients there for nutrition. She now can train people there and she's also done help pro promotion stuff. Like she's, she's actually making a flyer for the seminar I'm doing there, uh, yeah. which is thanks Megan. And um, you use the resources internally to grow the business. So the community of, uh, okay, here's another tactic to use that I want to bring up that people have asked. Your gym is covered in flags and banners from a bunch of local businesses. Yeah. yeah. So I have two sides of the gym. Uh, one side is more the powerlifting side. It just has the dumbbells, squat racks, combo racks, whatever. So I outfit that with more powerlifting and lifting related logos. I mean, just kind of fits better. On the other side, where it's all machines and cardio, and it looks a little nicer with the epoxy floors. I have, I think I counted today actually, I think eight businesses up there. So I have them pay either six months up front or 12 months up front to have it up there at all times. So you managed to create even even bigger local environment with local businesses where you're advertising for them mm -hmm. and in turn they're advertising back for your business, which is how you've grown to 200 members for a powerlifting based specific gym. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I know now at this point you're even talking about possibly moving to an even bigger bay, one more bay over, third bay, yeah. considered? I want to, but that fell through. So ah. <laughs> yeah. They, uh, I went to sign the agreement and he's like, Hey, they changed their mind. We're going to move the ballet studio down the strip. That was uh, messed up in the hurricane. So I didn't really know why I was like, okay, whatever. And silver lining takes stress off of me. What I have is working. It does get a little busy, but if I take that hypothetical rent that I was going to spend over there and stash it every month, that's just going to be a better investment for like a future building or future um, new location. That's how I look at it. So let's talk about that because now we've thrown a lot out there as far as the strategy used to start the community, grow the space, grow the community, house the meet, 
convince them to want to try power. Like, it didn't take much convincing at all. Um, I know initially it was a lot of, you mentioned Tiffany working with stay-at-home moms and stuff and women. That was really the genesis of your growth was all those women wanted to try powerlifting. I remember the first couple of meets, you had like 24 brand new first time powerlifters. And I think out of the 24, it was something like 17, 18 women and a couple of young kids that were their kids that wanted to get stronger for whatever high school sports and whatnot. It was all contained within itself. And like you said, compounded up. It wasn't like you were marketing with paid ads. It wasn't like you were doing commercials or trying to recruit trainers. It all stemmed from within the opportunity and the businesses are already there. Yeah, because I don't even know how to do that shit still. <laughs> <laughs> you really don't need to. Most people, see, I, I hate this phrase, uh, look outside the box, think outside the box. And I'm like, you haven't filled every possibility in the box first. There's so many things in front of you that you don't even see because you're so busy looking elsewhere. And until you've exhausted every possibility within your box, don't go elsewhere. Because there's a ton of opportunities. And they're all self-contained within George's gym from his garage. Well, let's talk about this structure because you mentioned getting busy. What does a typical day look like for you from start to finish with this structure? Uh, well, currently right now, I wake up about 4 a.m., get to the gym, take my walk, do my stretching, whatever I want to do for myself, start my sessions at between 5.30 a.m. and 6 a.m., typically on and off every day until about 10 or 11 a.m. Today was noon. I'll train, go home, cook, do what I need to do, go back between 3 and 4 p.m. for a few hours, and then pretty much done. Um, if I have a 30 minute break, so what I started doing is that time in the middle in my planner, I write down what I should be doing at that time. So like if it's programming, responding to text messages, cause I get a lot of those throughout the day that I can't respond to when I'm with people and, or like getting the locksmith then to like, um, I have a 24 hour access code coming in or a pin pad coming in. So like just a little shit like that. Like all those little operations that add up, I have to do during my very little small blocks. All right. So first hour of the day is yours. You get in there, you do your mobility, your stretching, your, your things. Uh, then you train clients. You have a break and train clients. At that point, it's looking at the planner, what needs to be done for the day task-wise or setting tasks up that need to be done. Mm -hmm. Back to work until about 3 or 4 p.m. And then after 3 or 4 p.m., what's going on? Oh, no. Between that 11 and 3 and 4 p.m. is my free time. So. So I train, get what I need to do done. Um, if I have any appointments, I do it in that time frame. I get back to the gym. I have between 3 and 5.30 p.m. or three people. And then I'm done at 6. And yeah. that's, pretty much, that's pretty much it. All right. What time are you going to bed? <laughs> um, either 8 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m. It really depends on the day. 10 p.m. and then up at 4, 4 a.m. So that's that's a quick one. Yeah. We'll definitely work on that one. All right, so let's talk about your structure. How are you creating personalized plans with that many people? Let's start from, uh, since a lot of them came from the beginning stages, do you have a specific structure you have them follow first and grow them to a personalized plan, or do you go right to the personalized plan for them? I guess it's more of the personalized plan for everyone, but you and I both know this. Like, when someone starts out, you just do basic shit. You could throw shit at a wall and it's going to work. Correct. I mean, within reason. So, uh, but you know this, you've talked about it a few times. I'm really big on getting, especially the people that are coming from almost scratch. I basically train them like bodybuilders. It's a lot of accessory work. They learn the movements, do sets of 10, eight, maybe fives, push themselves a little bit. Every now and then we'll load the bar up and teach them how to grind out a little bit. But already the beginning work is the, um, dumbbell chest press, machines, cables, single leg stuff, a lot of core stabilization stuff. And over time, they just move better at the bar. Like none of them actually, in my opinion, if you just train someone with a squat bench and deadlift with very minimal accessories for their first six months of training, it's probably not going to go well. And because they're not very aware of their bodies. Yeah, their purpose yeah. of awareness is super. Or they're not athletes coming in. They have no awareness. I mean, if somebody comes from athletic base, yeah, you can progress right to squat bench deadlift work. Yeah. But like you said, building that foundation of connection, mind-muscle connection, learning how to feel what's engaging. Because if you have someone try to set up for a squat and they don't know how to use their quads, the first thing they'll tell you is, I feel it all in my back. Yeah. So you're learning to develop those quads so they can actually feel them and use them. Yeah. Another thing that helps is they're all so like, you know, if they're 
kind of training together. They're at least having conversations in between sets that I hear a lot. So they're feeding off of each other. And whether they know it or not, they're learning from each other or they're teaching other people. Mm -hmm. and That's pretty good. Back to the programming aspect. Over time, you kind of get to know each person and then you can start making those little tweaks. And because there's no like, there's no system I use. Like, like again, I'm at the gym all the time. So like I know one person stressed out life six days a week, probably not training them as hard as the person that can make it to the gym four to five times a week for two hours a day. You know, as you learn their like personal life a little more, you can tailor their training more to how you think they're gonna recover. It's, it's huge. And that's just paying attention to what the client's giving you verbiage wise, feedback wise. They're telling you they're busy. They're telling you you're tired. It's on you to back it down because most of them are going to go into that mindset. I don't want to be a pussy today and I'm going to push and you're pushing them too hard and they're pushing them too hard. So it's that conversation of, hey, right now is not the time to push. Let's back you down a little bit and see what we can do. Sometimes that's better. Yeah. Like there are some people people were like if you looked at my sheet for them you'd be like wow he's fucking terrible like there are people that i'm like all right well we're gonna have to do like 10 sets of three at 75 percent, just so you look at like consistently hit depth because they're so new or just practicing the walkout with like very moderate loads or just little shit like that you don't say sports skill is practice yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Fucking Alvin, Alan Irons over here. We're talking about practice. It's like, I can't drill this enough. Like basic things, your gym habits become your meat habits. So if you're squatting high in the gym, you're going to squat high in the meat. If you don't know how to walk at the gym, you're not going to know how to walk at the meat. So I'm very big on just basic skill practice and do it intentionally because it makes everything easier. So when you're in a meet, it's autonomous. You don't think about it. You're just having fun. Yeah. Uh, you leave some pretty interesting feedback on some of their spreadsheets. I've seen people share and post it. Uh, <laughs> For those of you who are easily offended, tune out now. <laughs> there's a there's a lot of uh, uh, references to, to butt stuff and uh, you know those kinds of things. Um, how do you manage your humor with a gym that is predominantly female? Because if you don't know Jordan very well, Jordan is is a fan of crude and crass humor. Uh, Anthony Jizzlenek style, like he pulls no punches and doesn't care. So how do you manage your personality with the temperament of the gym? Well, I am a USPA referee. So. <laughs> but, okay. We'll Took that under the rug. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there's that. No, honestly, like, they're all my friends. So, like, they know me. They're the same way. So, of course, like, if someone comes off the streets, I'm not going to, like, show that just yet. But, like, other than that, like, they all know each other. They hang out with each other. They know who I am. So, yeah. So, and, like, yeah, you said they were all women, but, like. No, you got, bitch, you got a lot of guys in there now. Uh, yeah, 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 nighttime. Uh, night have a, the, guys from, the guys from like the commercial gyms that came over here. So like guys like Eugene, um, Anthony, and all them, they had friends at the other gym. They slowly trickled over, and it's kind of compounding just like the female side did from the other yeah. gym. Yeah. Pardon? He wants to do a guy's trip. He wants to do a, a trip abroad to like South America, a guy's trip. Just get a bunch of guys together and hang out in South America. Actually, in the middle of the night one night, he's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's my fault because we were texting back and forth I'm like yeah man i'm thinking about going to like south america on a trip or something he's like let's do a guy's trip i'm like okay and then uh he's like hang on he texts you i don't know it was like 10 or 11 at night right before i got off instagram he's like jordan's down let's go <laughs> just, whatever let's have fun all right cool uh maybe we'll make that a cruise because you and i both love cruises and i hadn't been on one in four years same five years all right so we've talked about your routine, how you start your first day with your stretching ability. So you prioritize you first and then you get to work for everybody else. Let's talk about your wind down because you have a super busy day. How do you wind down at the end of every day after all of that that you go through each day? Well, let's rewind really quick. Putting myself first, that was never, I used to roll out of bed, start training at five in the morning. And that really made my like personal lifts and all that shit. Like, as you know, like yeah. that decreased steadily over the years. Now I've kind of shifted that where I could actually plan my day around me and be a little more selfish. So that's good because business got to where it needs to be. When I ask for winding down, I really don't. I don't really, I mean, I just leave, hang out, eat, go to sleep when I have to. <laughs> <laughs> the good life. Yeah, I don't really have a wind down process because I'm not really, 
I don't know if uh, you're referring to just being like on overdrive during the day, but lately I've been pretty good. Well, that, that, that probably just, I would say, stems from your structure. Like when the day's done, you've done everything you have to, so you don't have that mental dump of everything you have to do tomorrow. And yeah. another thing I talked about is you have a planner. I do. So you go planner, and it's not like you have this drum of like, I need to remember to do this, I need to remember to do that. It's written down in your planner. It's, it's, like, it's gotten with them. So that's one of the cool takeaways. Jordan's got this planner here, and his day goes by the planner. Look at that. The plan, it's probably not happening or priority. Yeah. That is like organization and structure. I like yeah. it. Yeah, so I guess what you're saying is the wind down. I don't really have to plan for the next day. I plan that out about a week in advance. Not so I to shut the brain down and go to sleep. Yep. Yeah, I don't really – I'm not really on overdrive too much. <laughs> How was soccer practice? <laughs> oh, that's... All right. Most memorable coaching experiments. Oh, sorry, experience. experience. What's your most memorable coaching or gym experience that you have right now? Good or bad? So coaching, I mean, it's cool all the time, but obviously the meets we hold, um, those are the highlights. Um, the one that really comes to mind is the last one we did in December. I think it was Flight B. Like, I had girls in all the flights, but I think flight B, we had, like, eight back-to-back, -back, and they were all going for PRs in their third deadlift. So it was, like, Laura Coyne and Lori Bemis, or Bemis, sorry, I don't know the last name. She corrects you every time on the mic, too, and I don't even know it. Like, they both did their first 303s. Um, Mari went hit 347. Tiffany went after that, hit her PR 369. Before Laura and Lori, we had a bunch of PRs. So it was just, like, nonstop, back to and no misses. And all looked like they might miss. Like, it was all grinder. Like, Jessica Trapani, she pulled the 308. Um, and she had a very hard training cycle before that. So, like, you see me in the background looking like I'm going to shit my pants. Like, it's just those meets are probably the most excited I ever get because it's so stressful. And, like, luckily they all do pretty damn good most of the time. So, like, those are the memorable ones. I uh, talk about this often with people when they get jaded by the sport. <laughs> And they're created by the sport because they're looking at the American Pro or they're looking at the Pioneer Invitational or they're looking at, you know, all these big meets like the, the Go Strong and people talk about egos and drama and all this shit. And I'm like, if you want to fall in love with the sport again, go to your local meets because that's what doesn't matter. People are just there to have fun and having a good time and they're laughing. You know, you have someone who's squatting 187 pounds and she's like a soccer mom and it's her first meet. And she's like amazed that she just squatted 187 pounds. It's the same meet that somebody's probably squatting 700, 800 and it doesn't matter. Is just everyone's there for the same purpose, just to see what they can do and have fun. I, I love that. And, and the funny thing about that is RPS doesn't always have the best known standards nationally for their meets. So people have come to the meets, and you're surprised. As judges there, we hold the highest standard. Yeah, man. The first flight was predominantly people from your gym in that meet. And I remember we recalled that for the first squat flight, there wasn't a single person who missed depth, I don't think. There wasn't a single red flag for, like, missing depth in that first flight of that meet, we just look at each other like everyone here has been trained to the right standard. Yeah, those flights A and B, so I typically, so flight A, what I typically do is I get the lighter lifters and the kids and the newer ones all in one, so they're a little more comfortable. Mm -hmm. and I'll put the rest as it goes. So like flight A, I always try to make like your newer people. Yeah. Uh, and it works out really good, good because they almost set the standard for, yeah, they set the standard for the rest of the day because if they're new and they miss the list because of a technical rule, everyone else sees it and they learn from that. And since they're so new, like making those mistakes, they're going to learn that for the rest of their, their meets. So, yeah. All right. So you have a gym that started off as fitness. It's grown towards powerlifting. You know, you were powerlifting, grown towards powerlifting, it's grown towards meets, it's grown towards community. It's even grown towards fundraisers. What is the nutrition structure? Do you have a nutrition structure that people are able to get or work with? I know you work with Paul individually. Paul needs does your nutrition for you individually. Uh, do you refer out to that? Do you have a program involved for that? Or is it something that you allow the community to grow to on their own and seek out individual help if they want it? Or any suggestions there? All, all the above. So let's see. The first one, like, if they talk to me about it, I'll give guidelines. Um, I don't typically be like, hey, I'll coach you for nutrition for extra money or whatever. I just kind of give them guidelines, give them good references. Typically I'll refer out. Um, I did bring Paul and Olivia in for a seminar and I think they got a lot out of that. Unfortunately, in my opinion, a lot of them don't really, 
because they would say they go like I eat good right and i don't think they do i mean if they do they have like a skewed idea of what that is or they're just not entirely consistent so that's why i like to refer out to people because i don't want to have to deal with that like i guess frustration i mean because it's almost like yeah i'm doing what you said but it's like are you maybe you should pay someone that where you check in with them daily or weekly fill out a spreadsheet for them be held very accountable and like learn the process because i don't have time for that um i do have a few people that i started working with more of one-on-one -on -one nutrition um, I don't really charge extra for it. It's just I keep them accountable by giving them like guideline macros. They just to hold them um, accountable to their goals, and they've been doing pretty good. Uh, like the three or four that are doing that, and uh, Megan, she, as you said earlier, she's got her own nutrition business. So a few people from my gym work with her as well. All right. So yeah. So it's almost like. You're acknowledging your limitations. Here's where you're stretched to. You don't want to stretch beyond that. You'd rather refer out, which again keeps building more and more of your community. Yeah. Because you're coach Paul, attract more people, more clients. You've even brought them out in the seminar. You're helping your members. Megan has done nutrition coaching for them, and there's outlets and things. So you've you've set limitations on how much you're willing to stretch yourself to make sure you don't get stretched too thin. Yeah. And really, it's very difficult. Like as we discussed before, a lot of the clientele in terms of who I program for, they are females. So really talking about nutrition gets tough because they get like defensive, emotional, or <laughs> like, how they're wired and it's not like offense to them. Or they always say something like, well, what should I eat? What's the best? And it's like, there's no such thing. So like having the time to educate them on that process doesn't really work well. Yeah. Uh, the, the basics are not exciting when it comes to nutrition. The basics are exciting when it comes to training, but the yeah. basics very excited when it comes to nutrition, having to explain someone that it really maps on your total exactly. your macros and you can get them from anywhere, <laughs> make them work. All right. So we've gone over the business growth. Uh, let's go over. I love the book question. I know it makes people uncomfortable, but I love the book question because it gives a insight into who you are, what you think. So what is a book you recommend that everyone read? Like any book? Yeah. yeah. Um, the Relentless and Winning Books from Tim Grover. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, why? I think, so Relentless, it'll really make you kind of look in, look at yourself and see, like, what kind of person you really are. Um, if they're cleaner, you know, like all those terms. Um, cleaner, just read the, yeah. yeah. And the characteristics of that. And winning is kind of an expansion of that. It uh, kind of goes into the mindset of things like who you are like whether you're in business sports even if you're just a fucking cook like if you like the term winning is basically nothing else matters and you're going to do what you're going to do to hit your goals yeah in, in relentless he goes over a lot of how we're driven by darkness in a lot of situations he goes over like tiger woods is yeah. secret life he has the the cooler, the cleaner, and the closer, what type of personality you are, uh, whether you're a pressure player, you want the ball when the game's on the line kind of thing, or if you're someone who's like a mid-tier player in the whole nine. And I think there's a lot to be valued from understanding, I don't want to say your rank in life, but where you're at now mentally, because that can always change. You know, some people are starting off as coolers and grow to become closers in the whole nine. So I like that. Interesting one. All right. Let's talk about how people can reach you if they want to work with you, do something with you, promote the meets, promote the business, or gain coaching from you. Instagram, um, Wong Stuong, uh, Chad Walker, Chad Walker, so last name W-O-N-G-S-T-W-O-N-G, um, email, same thing, uh, with training at the email, yeah, or just Wong, show at yeah, Showcase Strength and Fitness, um, uh, Instagram, just message me there. All right, All right. what events you got coming up? I have the RPS Showcase Super Classic 3 on June 24th and 25th. Um, contemplating putting on some sort of charity deadlift only meet. Again, like coins for a cause, but we'll see. Try not to stress myself out too much there. So it probably is just going to be the June meet, maybe a little something after that, and then December. Okay. Cream now, cream. you brought up coins for cause that was something you did at the beginning of last year in march if i'm not mistaken mm -hmm. uh you raised how much for a local high school ten thousand dollars ten thousand dollars for a local high school weight room which is also the high school that actually now 
hosts your meat venues, right? Is the venue for your meats? Yeah, everything you saw in their weight room came from that event. It's pretty spectacular. So there's another avenue that people don't understand or reach out for. You raised money for a local school, which has a shit ton of parents and a shit ton of students who probably need gym access and experience. <laughs> so if you're looking for hidden strategies to grow your gym, find the areas that are well populated in your local community and get involved with them because then your name's going to be out there on the tip of everyone's tongue involved in that school and that business. So that's parents, that's kids. They're already involved in a weightlifting program and they want to have a powerlifting outlet. It fit pretty hand in hand. Yeah, and it really didn't, like, it really wasn't on a purpose like that, but um, from what I can tell over the last couple of years of doing things like this, kind of what goes around comes around, like, in a positive way. You usually hear that way, but we lost the, um, we lost the meat venue for uh, King and Queen of the Platform last year, CrossFit Warpath, so we had to change the Imagine School, and we got right in because of that event, so... And now we just have, seems like we have a formed relationship with them and it looks like we're going to be doing that moving forward. It's a great space. It's right up the road and just a domino effect. Um, like Northport High School, the high school I went to, they've been sending out emails because they, their students and interest in athletics is outgrowing what they have. Um, from what I've heard, they've had the same like small room to lift in from what they had when I was in high school. And... Like, I'll be sending some sponsorship money there, and I'm contemplating doing some sort of exhibition event to help them as well. So, yeah. Pretty cool. All right. Anything else you want to add to that? No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so insightful. <laughs> really? Well, I appreciate you giving me the time today. It's always fun to do these. People get to learn more about the individual, what they do, how they help. Uh, there's so many people who want to have that gym space and open a gym space and grow it. So I think this is incredibly helpful for how you grew the community, uh, started the process of expanding your space, grew the community that you already had into a part of the community, expanded into meet direction. I uh, wouldn't even add in, there's other avenues there besides the coaching, the personal training, but you also have apparel because your, your gym sells shirts, the meat sells shirts, your different meat shirts and other avenues that keep going in there and other local businesses like uh, Rita's Italian Ice comes out for every one of your meats. There's a truck. Uh, I don't know Eric was on here. I, I know he does like tropic storm protection. Uh, he's, the meats. No, Eric has his floor cleaning business. Floor so cleaning. Uh, he actually cleans the gym. The storm? Oh, that's Jeff and Jessica. Thank you, Jeff and Jessica. Okay, yeah. So it just it shows that the community has not just grown itself, but supports the mission because they're they're providing sponsorship money for the meets. They're providing people for the meets. Uh, their banners are up in your business, and then anyone who comes into their business is seeing your banner or your business as well, and how that all feeds each other inside the box instead of being outside the box. It's pretty cool and insightful because a lot of people don't see that. They think of what are my marketing strategies, and it's like you're not even marketing. You're just building your community bigger and bigger and bigger by building within it. Yeah. Like one other thing too, like if people – like we always hear I want to open up a gym, and if we go back to near the beginning of the podcast, I think your best – Best way to go about that is work at your local commercial gym. Maybe not like a Planet Fitness, but maybe something like a Crunch. Learn how they do their sales. Learn their like um, orientation process, how they go from the front door to the personal training to the membership, all that. And just learn how they generate revenue. I mean, even if you can't, even if you want to open a small powerlifting gym, if you just take 10 to 20% of that, you will have a lot more knowledge and most people doing it in terms of how to make money. And of course, everyone's going to say like, well, we can't expect to always make money, but money is what helps you upgrade your equipment. Money is what helps you stay in business. I mean, I do what I can for the money for yeah myself to make a living, but all the money I make from the gym, these events go back into the gym. So it's a better experience for the lifters. So if you don't have that background knowledge, you're never going to be able to do that. And those corporates or corporations are spending millions of dollars to perfect and modify their back end systems and sales systems. So you're, you know, spot on. Learn how they do that because that's free and you're getting paid to do so in the process. And then you can grow it from there on your own. Yeah. Then you can just steal all their business once you get to know them all. Yep. <laughs> that's right with you. All right, cool. So that was very, very informative. I appreciate it. It's super awesome for anyone in the business. Anyone who wants to reach out to Jordan, it's at Wong Strong on, 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 a. Uh, Instagram, which is, of course, he's here. You can follow him here, or you can email him the same. And if anyone wants to come down to Florida to do some of the best meets in Florida, the RPS showcase meets are fantastic. Oh, tell him about the seminar you're putting on at the gym. Oh, uh, May 5th, I'll be at Showcase Strength and Fitness. Uh, May, May 6th, sorry, I had a day. 
afterwards. May 6th, which is a Saturday from like 9 to 2.30, we'll do a lift along after and probably go out to dinner with everybody and have fun. But we'll be there in Florida doing a seminar going over mindset, programming, breakdowns of the big three, which are always interesting cues, especially because some of these lifters are newer. They're not necessarily aware or familiar. And different perspective because my background's obviously very very diverse in lifting, but you know, they, they get only a certain perspective within their own gym. So this will give them ideas of things that Jordan may not be able to see or people in the community they might not know. And I promise I don't talk this fast in person. <laughs> Can't wait. They're um, gonna better so. yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll caffeinate up for that. It'll be a fun Saturday. Maybe we'll go out for some pizza or something afterwards. We'll have a good time. So hopefully everyone can make it down for that. I look forward to it. And Megan is finishing up the uh, flyer for that this week, so we'll put that out there. All right. Thank you. Have a good one.